the Baltimore County Board of Education. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion and as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Mr. Edwards or Ms. Barr if you have to leave the meeting early um, using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Mr. Edwards, please call the roll to determine presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. I will start with Ms. Booker Dwyer. Present. Ms. Frempong. Present. Ms. Harvey. Mr. Young. Present. Mr. McMillian. Present. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. A quorum is present. Uh, Mr. Edwards, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Ms. Manna. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Strait. Here. Ms. Sample. Here. Ms. Crew. Present. Ms. Jamison. Here. Ms. Smith. Present. Okay, uh, Mr. Hartlove. Here. Dr. Grimm. Mr. Welsh. Present. Mr. Roberts. Present. Thank you. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Okay, hearing none, I will turn the meeting back to you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Thank you, Mr. Edwards, and we will dive right in. Um, so, Ms. Crew, please proceed with the Facilities Maintenance Work Order Process Audit Report. Good afternoon, board members, staff, guests. We recently completed the Facilities Management Audit and issued our final report on October 8th. I want to thank Mr. Welsh and Mr. Roberts for being here with us today. This report is posted on our website and on board docs. The Office of Facility Support Services is responsible for maintaining 17.5 million square feet of buildings a space through the work order process. The work orders are classified into four different categories, corrective, emergency, preventative, and scheduled. This audit focused on the corrective and emergency work orders as these work orders are part of the prioritization process. The Office of Maintenance has a benchmark for corrective work orders of 60 days and 24 hours to complete emergency work orders. However, if work orders cannot be emergency work orders cannot be completed in 24 hours, the emergency is to be made safe within 24 hours. As part of the audit, data analytics was completed on the work order data for the last three fiscal years, FY22, FY23, and FY24. The number of work orders, sorry, the number of work orders has been consistent in the last three years except for an increase in emergency work orders in FY24. The average number of days to complete has increased for both corrective and emergency work orders. While the number of days has increased for a corrective, the 38.1 days is still within the 60 day benchmark. For emergency work orders, it is 15.4 days to complete, which is over the one day benchmark. However, work orders that are mitigated remain open as emergency work orders until completely fixed. We identified four work order categories 
where the average days to complete corrective work orders has increased. Contract maintenance, environmental, general maintenance, and HVAC. However, three of the four are still under the 60-day benchmark. In addition, we identified four categories over the 60-day benchmark, although three have decreased in the average number of days. For emergency work orders, we identified four work order categories where the average number of days to complete has increased. That's for electrical, electronics, environmental, and HVAC. Also for emergency work orders, only one work order category met the one day benchmark with six categories being over 10 days. In addition, we also wanted to point out that according to the Association of Physical Plant Administration, BCPS has a shortage of approximately 116 FTEs and an annual, annual budget shortage of approximately 7.5 million. At this point, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Welsh to discuss the da data analytics. Thank you, Ms. Crew. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Audit Committee and, uh, and Madam Chair and, and uh, all of our professionals that are here. Uh, and thank you for this opportunity to share the, the work that we do. Um, Ms. Crew uh, really did a phenomenal job of, of sharing her understanding. Uh, we've had a great deal of opportunity to kind of collaborate on processes as well as um, me to share how we manage and monitor a substantial amount of workflow with the resources that we have. Um, the APPA standard, while it may seem eccentric uh, or exorbitant by comparison to our current staffing and our current budget standards, uh, that just kind of shows the, the efforts of our team to allocate that work and allocate the resources for our most critical needs, and we do that on, on a regular basis. Um, the FTE comparison is, is really for uh, to show the value of, of some of these critical services that we provide in our HVAC, our electronics, and our plumbing shops predominantly, and then the volume for our general maintenance team that does everything from roofing to walls to painting to glass work to brick work, both inside and outside of the schoolhouse. So I just wanted to help validate some of the data that was kind of put together. Um, I, I think this crew, you did a phenomenal job in sharing. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Welsh. Uh, the objective of the audit was to determine if the Office of Facility Support Services has an effective work order process in place. Our audit identified three commendations and three findings. First, we for our accommodations, we would like to recognize Mr. Welsh and thank him for his support and cooperation in completing this review. Next, the Office of Maintenance is monitoring outstanding work orders on a regular basis. Corrective work orders are monitored weekly and emergency work orders are monitored continuously. In addition, for the Maryland Interactive Commission Maintenance Effectiveness Assessment, for FY23, Baltimore County Public Schools has the third best rating out of the 24 school systems in the state of Maryland. The FY24 report has not been issued yet. The first issue uh, is the Office of Facility Support Services does not have standard operating procedures, SOPs, to document their work order process. Our recommendation is that the work order process should be documented in an SOP to ensure proper prioritization, compliance with establishment benchmarks, and efficiency in the completion of the work orders. I will turn it over again to Mr. Welsh to discuss the corrective action for this recommendation. And thank you again, Ms. Crew, and thank you again, Audit Committee Chair Member and the members. Um, I just like to offer that I, I appreciate the value of what we submit to our, to our state partners, uh, the comprehensive maintenance plan, the maintenance effective assessment. Uh, it falls directly in line with what we would deem as best practice for, for monitoring as well as adhering to a standard regarding our workflow and our, our resources available. Uh, what we intend to do in terms of a correction action is to gather the multiple resources that we have from trainings, training videos, uh, the implementation of our work order process, and some of our definitions, 
and to engage our stakeholders, all the stakeholders, whether it be the principals, the operations team members that are submitting the work requests on behalf of the school, as well as the maintenance liaisons that are directing and assigning the work to our mechanics and to our contractors to kind of uh, standardize and, and supplement their learning tools and their resources in a single source through an SOP that is very definitive for our best practices regarding our documentation of our workflow. Thank you all for that opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. The second issue is the work orders are not prioritized accurately based on the severity of the issue. Our recommendation is that the Office of Facility Support Services must ensure that all emergency work orders are called into the call center. Additionally, the Office of Facility Support Services should provide training to appropriate individuals related to the prioritization of work orders. I will turn it over to Mr. Welsh to discuss the corrective action plan for this recommendation. Yes, thank you again. Uh, for, for this, it, it's, it's, a, it's very challenging um, when there's so many moving parts to our work order process. And uh, I just want to just take an opportunity, if I could, to share some of those difficulties and challenges. Uh, as, as we all know, in the, in the time frame that we're evaluating the workflow, the world has changed around us. And what was an emergency yesterday may not be one tomorrow and vice versa. An emergency may pop, whether it be a, a building security related issue, an HVAC issue due to ventilation. It, it's a constantly changing uh, benchmark that we need to adapt to regarding what our schoolhouses and what our, our, our students and teachers need. So it is a it is a challenge. However, I will say that uh, we intend to do a, a substantially improved job in, in continuing the training of both our requesters, our customers, as well as our in-house maintenance staff that are responding. Defining the word emergency is a critical need. Uh, and while we will never be so lucky as to have it be black and white. I think we can do a finer job with our customers and with our with our, with our um, our operations team members to help validate that work and make sure it is documented correctly. One of the additional challenges and is really based around our maintenance effective assessment uh, as dictated by the IAC, which is the Interagency of School Construction, uh, Intercommission of, of uh, Commission of School Construction. They set up a standard that requires us to track emergencies through the entire work order process. So while it may be more beneficial for us to toggle that emergent you know, designation, we would lose sight of that, that process if we did change that work order. So when you see that elevated number in our emergency response, I can assure you that we are addressing to the best of our abilities through our mitigation efforts for that workflow, even if it is sitting in that category longer than the one day. Um, all of our emergencies are responded to within 24 hours, and in some circumstances, they are kind of downgraded to what would be considered a corrective, but I do not make that designation in the work order system for purpose. Uh, it is to track the quantity and value of those emergencies. And Ms. Cruz, uh, if you are in charge of the screen, if you could kind of scroll back to the emergencies count, which showcases the bar chart, where the 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 number of emergencies has more than doubled in that three year time realm. Uh, you know, we were at 2480 and now we're at 4964. And 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 th that's a that's a very difficult challenge for our maintenance staff to contend with, with our resources remaining consistent and in some cases reduced and certainly our budgetary constraints. So thank you for that opportunity to share. We will work with all stakeholders to develop recurring training uh, as as our maintenance workflow process evolves. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. And the final issue is that the work orders are not completed in accordance with the established benchmarks. Our recommendation is the Office of Maintenance should continue to identify and monitor the areas where the benchmarks are not being met and assess the resources required to complete the work orders on time. Continue to work with the Department of Human Resources to fill out standing vacancies and also to determine if additional positions are needed or, and consider the use of contracted services to complete work orders, the work orders timely. Um, again, turn it over to Mr. Welsh for the final uh, corrective issue recommendation. Again, thank you all. This opportunity is, is one that is uh, is very important to me. Um, I work with my, my leadership, Mr. Roberts and Dr. Grimm uh, regularly. To, to allocate the resources available and, and make sure that we are committing to the needs of our students and, and our staff. 
So one of the first things that we intend to do is to extend the measurement tool that we use as our benchmark data to include all schools on a weekly basis where we are measuring what I'll call work that is within compliance or less than 30 days old, work that is slightly out of compliance, which is greater than 30 days old, and work that is more severely out of compliance or work that is 60 days old. We're going to use that data tracking and we're going to present that on a weekly basis to our shop leadership in all of our different traits in an effort to reduce those extremes, even with the limited resources that we have to put an emphasis and focus on that 60 day plus compliance and then working our way down towards getting the uh, the work within our compliance window and certainly recognizing any obstacles, challenges and, 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 and adapting those benchmarks based on the way that our students and our teachers need. Um, I share that because on a annual basis and on an ongoing basis, I work with my budget team. I work with um, the uh, the uh, the fiscal services groups. Every opportunity that I've had in my uh, nine years here with BCPS to share um, additional need and that need is is very well considered by my leadership team. And I certainly recognize and respect the the the, the availability of resources and, and when they are, are more prevalent and, and less prevalent. And again, we'll continue to to toggle that need based on our most critical needs for our students and staff. Um, I, I believe the APPA standard data, while it may be exorbitant in terms of, of value and, and, and resources available, our staffing partners have been excellent uh, collaborators. Um, we've done amazing things for fulfilling some of these most critical vacancies over the last uh, year. Uh, I want to thank all the team members that helped that uh, that class action upgrade occur for my for my licensed trade individuals. It's really shown their value and it's helped us fill some of our most critical vacancies. And then ultimately, we will continue to share our concerns regarding being able to maintain compliance as well as functionality on services such as elevators and chairlifts and roofs and HVAC systems and plumbing systems uh, in an aging school system. It's very difficult to continue to maintain, but I want to thank my leadership and all members here for their support as we as we value our resources and, and our workflow uh, effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Uh, that concludes our present presentation of this audit. Ms. Booker Dreyer, I'll turn it back over to you for any questions. Okay, thank you. So board members, do you have any questions? I do. Ms. Yes, go ahead. Um, so we'll go to Mr. McMillian and then Ms. Frimpong. Well, I saw Ms. Frimpong popped up just as I was raising my hand, so she can go first. Okay, Ms. Frimpong and then Mr. McMillian. Thank you, Mr. McMillian, always a gentleman. Um, Mr. Welsh, thank you so much for um, the information, Ms. Ms. Crew as well. Um, but Mr. Welsh, I guess I want to commend your team for doing so much with, I guess, the phrase so little. This report, as far as when it talks about the standards, really speaks to, um, I guess, the deficit that we have. Um, so just a couple of things. Um, the first one is when you talk about the SOPs um, that are going to be um, completed for the work processes, is that going to extend beyond just facilities and maintenance? So, for example, when you talk about this training of customers and in-house staff so that they understand better what is an emergency um, or what constitutes an emergency, is that going to be a part of the SOP or is that something separate. Thank you for the question. Um, what I intend to do is develop the SOP based off of the training materials that we have put together um, uh, three years ago, actually during the pandemic and during our ransomware attack, we were in transition and developing the current work order system. So we have put together many, many training videos as well as organized sessions where we were implementing our new work order system as well as our processes in conjunction with the maintenance effective assessments going on from our state partners. What I intend to do is to develop that SOP to be all encompassing in terms of our workflow process and then using that tool as part of our other facility support services and facilities management partners to share how we do business and hopefully help them better I'll say um, designate the work as it's coming into our call center. As, as Ms. Crew shared, one of the obstacles is 
what would be considered corrective versus what would be considered a, an emergency. And we have different resources for those different facets or designations of workflow. So by sharing our standard operating procedure for workflow management, I do think we can do a better job of, of not only completing our most critical work timely, but also documenting the work and continuing to show um, a robust need for additional resources. I hope I answered your question. You did. Thank you. And then um, as we saw from the trend, you had your emergency work orders doubled. Um, what has been the trend for your workforce in general? Is it increasing as far as your personnel available? Is it decreasing, staying about the same? So we tend to use the the the, the number 40,000 work orders per year fairly regularly. Um, I will say that the the workflow that has come in has really changed in terms of designation over the three year time period that this audit was can you know evaluating. Um, what is an emergency is a very interesting question depending on who you ask. And our goal is always to support our customer to the best of our ability. So, you know, uh, to, to use an exaggeration, um, a painting emergency may be critical for a principal that has a school that is aging, but a boiler emergency where a school that's brand new that does not have heat might be of conflicting priorities. So I would say that the, the, the volume of work has maintained relative consistently, but the, the value of that work and the urgency of that work has really changed the way we've had to do business over the course of the, the three years of this audit. Makes sense. Okay, and then as we are going to be going into budget season, um, I guess, is this helpful? Was this, how am I trying to say this? Basically, I guess, asking for additional funding. So when we talk about the volume may have stayed, um, you have about 40,000 work orders regularly. But as far as your staff to deal with that, um, it doesn't sound like at least that you have what you need. So um, I guess as we come to budget season, budget season, will you be able to be asking for that additional funding to help support um, the facilities and maintenance with all these different work orders that you're getting? Yes, and thank you for the question. So um, on a regular basis, and certainly in the FY26 budget requests, what I've done is I've looked at our FY20 all the way up to current uh, historical trends, uh, our contract support services, our, our parts and supplies lines. Uh, we have a very, very complex budget with lots of moving parts. And certainly um, what I try to do, since you cannot predict where the next corrective action will need to be, um, it's very difficult for me to, to predict uh, a need based on an unknown um, facilities management problem. However, I can use the age of equipment. Uh, there are various resources. Uh, we have multiple assessments that are done from both our facilities construction and improvement partners, our operations team members, and we are always looking at our most critical assets and valuing their recurring uh, maintenance failures when they come about. So I try to use all of that data to supplement through our A4 request process what I anticipate a particular need might be. In addition, our partners in the state that are uh, our compliance bodies, meaning like the IAC, Department of Labor Licensing and Resources, um, any of the, the boilers, the hot water tanks, so they call them pressure vessels that have needs, uh, our, our, uh, our water testing, all of those facets need to be fully budgeted and fully funded to, to maintain that critical compliance. So all those different parts uh, have required historically for us to, to move our funding where it is most needed on a on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. And I will continue to do that while continuing to make the proper requests through the mechanisms available to me for both staffing as well as contractual funding needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. That's all my questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Brumpong. Uh, Mr. McMillian? Yeah, Mr. Walsh, so we went through those slides pretty quickly, but I think I've got this right. You currently have 144.6 full-time employees. Yes, and I want to be clear about that. So these are the employees in my maintenance unit that actually are performing maintenance services, whether it be uh, and again, I hate to use uh, stereotypes, but people that turn wrenches as well as people that engage our contracts for our contractual services. That does not include individuals like myself that manage resources, uh, shop leadership, 
what I've done is I've tried to illustrate our, our available resources that can actually solve problems by putting wrench to bolt or by putting checkbook and phone to service. So yes, that's correct. Okay, so you have 144 and you're missing 116. You can still use, uh, you have 116 slots not full. Not that filled. is correct. That is correct, sir, yes. So if you had them all, it looks like it would be 260 people in your department. And okay. again, that's, ba that's based off of one benchmark, which is that APPA standard that our IAC MEA partners utilize as part of our comprehensive maintenance plan. Yes, sir. Okay, my next question was about the benchmarks. So does the IAC establish those benchmarks Who for the different categories? Who establishes those? So um, historically, the 60-day the, the benchmark is been our self-induced benchmark based on the fact that when I came to BCPS, that number was far greater. Um, we've whittled our way down from a backlog of you know tens of thousands of tickets down to less than that. And the age of those tickets has been reduced dramatically as well. So what I've done is I've, I've evolved that benchmark over time. The IAC maintenance effectiveness assessment chooses a benchmark of 30 days. So we are 30 days uh, away from what the IAC would be considered as an adequacy standard. And of course, there is built into their evaluation process a tolerance for work that, that might not be able to meet that benchmark. And I believe that number is 30%. So the IAC MEA effectiveness assessment has dictated that they would like to see all schools have all of their work completed within 30 days, all of their corrective or emergent work complete within 30 days with less than a 30% tolerance for, for change. We are striving every day to get closer to that mark. And if we were to look at data for each on a per shop basis, uh, what I will say is our adequately resourced shops are closer to meeting that 30 day benchmark. But I, I, try to, I, I try to run a shop that shows success on a regular basis. So what I try to do is manage that, that expectation based on the schools that are being assessed while I'm working towards the entire portfolio of schools meeting that threshold. And we have a consorted effort uh, this year to even get closer to that benchmark of 30 days uh, in, in the next fiscal year. So thank you, sir. Okay. And lastly, I'm just trying to understand, you know, how you, you got a rating of third out of 24 school systems in 23 with an average rating of 74.74%, which was, you know, an adequate rating. But then the IAC changed around the the maintenance effectiveness assessment. So now they even quote the new MEA scores are not compatible with past scores. So I'm just curious, uh, when do you anticipate this results letter is going to come out uh, for 24 to see where you stand on that? Thank you, sir. Yes, and, and uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of explain what you just shared. So the maintenance effectiveness assessment changed its scoring capacity and its rubric in advance of the reports that have been shared with you as part of this uh, this audit. So that change or that transition had occurred and the the highlight of the event that's been shared at the superintendent level was that the goal being for all schools to be adequately maintained. And by being adequately maintained, they are giving that score parameter of 70 to 79 percent would be considered adequacy. They would rather see our entire portfolio rest in adequacy before one school got to a good or a higher rating based on the resources that the state knows we have available. I, I share that piece because I think as we go forward, the intent is for all of our work to be in compliance with their benchmarks and then all of our work to at our oldest school to our newest school to be maintained consistently under the guise and standards that are laid forth. So when you when you read that information, that data will start to show those true colors as every school is evaluated. I believe we've had maybe I'm, I'm estimating here 100 schools have been audited thus far with that adequacy standard. We still have 80 to go and then the repeat cycle whenever that begins to occur will show the value of our consistency. Your, your second question was based around when do we anticipate 
the the FY24 numbers to become available very, very soon. They're actually already available unofficially. And, and as Ms. Crew, uh, I believe, documented in the report, um, our, our numbers have gone up. I don't know what that will mean in comparison to the rest of the state because I've not seen that final report. But our our percentages, I think, are going to be closer to 75 or 76 percent in the FY24, which means we're improving. Um, I hope the other LEAs are improving as well. But uh, but I, that, that is an annual report that typically comes out. Um, I think um, no, November to December is when it is evaluated by their board. And then no later than the mid January time frame is when that report is published. Mr. Walsh, thank you very much for taking your time to answer my questions. And it certainly appears that you know your topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. So, Mr. Welsh, I have a couple of questions, and um, and then we're just thank you for the work that you're doing because Baltimore County really does have some of the oldest buildings in the state, and I just couldn't imagine um, some of these emergency requests that you have to deal with in these very old, old buildings. And so, um, and so my. One of my questions is, um, what is the root cause for delays in work order completion? So I, I believe the root cause is, in fact, based around uh, based around resources. Um, the, 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 the student work day, the, the school work day, the maintenance work day, and everything that's required to prepare for a successful school day and to close out an effective school day is a real challenge. While many of our partners uh, have um, a 40 hour work week, that is not the case for, for my group. Uh, a work day could start at 4.30 a.m. and could continue straight through to that 4.30 p.m., uh, 4.30 a.m. the next day, depending on circumstances. And as the, the definition of emergency has changed as by need and certainly by, by value of our, of our workflow, we have forced ourselves to become, um, to, to make a comparison, we are an emergency room for buildings and building assets. One of the biggest challenges is we also want to be that family care practitioner where we are putting our best foot forward to prevent emergencies, to prevent that corrective need. But it's really, it, it, it becomes a, a secondary effort, not by choice, but by need based on our resources. So that, that delay is really and truthfully based around being able to fully complete a task and, and say that we have corrected a matter fully is not as easy as it once was. Um, I hope I answered your question. Oh, that That's helpful. Um, and then when I think about when you say shortage in staff, so I, you know, Baltimore County has some of the best CTE programs in the nation, and we are developing a pipeline of students who are who can fix HVAC and construction trades, all of that. So it's facilities management leveraging CTE students at all um, to support any of um, the work in facilities. Has that has that structure been set up like it's set up in other school systems? I thank you for that question. I'm very proud to say that, yes, it is. I, I've worked with our CTA partners um, many, many years. Um, We've 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 met some challenges regarding uh, licensure and compliance for some of our more critical trades, but we've found ways to navigate through them. Um, I have hired full time team members that that have worked for us, uh, that have uh, you know used it as a, a leapfrog opportunity into their careers in HVAC, their careers in general maintenance, painting, what have you. Um, I'm very apprised of the CTE program, and I am annually working with them. For some of our trades, uh, some of the trades, it, it's a challenge because having our AFSME union uh, as a partner for this regarding licensed trade opportunities has some funding as well as some some uh, educational challenges that we are regularly working through. To, to become a plumber, you can't just say, hey, I want to be a plumber. Uh, you've got to mandate, uh, you, you're mandated by our state and our county partners as to how you can go about getting that licensure and the work that you can perform while conducting an apprentice versus a journey versus a master license. So as much as we are interested in bringing on that, that incoming, uh, that graduating senior that has a desire to become part of a trade, there is a, a growth and mentoring necessity 
or that partner needs to have a, a seat in a truck. They need to have a journey plumber that can verify and validate the, the work that they're putting forward towards their credentials. And then they need to have a master license holder that can sign off for those credited hours so that they can ultimately take that test to get to the next level and become a fully functional independent plumber for BCPS. But to answer your question in a very simple term, absolutely, it is a great resource. And I'm proud to say we have hired successful maintenance employees in that program. And then my um, my other question is, um, is are we setting our with the targets that are set right now? Are they realistic? And so I'm thinking about like a one day um, the, the fix for an emergency uh, problem if an emergency comes up. Well, I know that's the ideal, um, but given like all the things that you have said, is one day truly realistic? Is it a realistic expectation? Yes, and thank you to, for the opportunity to answer this question as well. So um, one of the things that may have come through a little bit shady uh, or, or, or not clear in the in the explanation at the beginning, our efforts are to completely resolve corrective and emergent maintenance problems. Our, our target goal for that one day is to mitigate and make safe. So while sometimes that's as simple as as the school has no heat, I can click a button and make that heat come back because of a power outage. I can I can fully resolve that immediately. Another might be a busted pipe that has 10, 20 feet of underground piping that needs to be dug up and, and put back together again to make that system whole again. So my mitigation effort would be to simply valve off that area to make it so that the water is not free flowing into the building. So what may not be clear is our efforts are to mitigate emergencies, if not solve them in that 24 hour period to make it so that the educational space is functional for our students. And we recognize very little, you know, closure or impact to the educational program. Our efforts are not to holistically solve all emergency problems in one day. Is that, does that help clarify? That helps to clarify. And I think, um, you know, when I think about this audit report, I, I almost feel like that needs to be made clear that um, that when we're dealing with an emergency, that it's around that mitigation and making it safe so that students can still go to school um, and learn, not that it's going to be fully fixed. And so uh, so I'm just so I so when I see that um, the audit report and think about, you know, these emergency classifications, I almost want to see was facilities able to mitigate and make safe that like is that what's being reported here or are we reporting the full completion of whatever the problem was that um that that occurred yes the report is showcasing the full completion and and that that was one of the difficulties that self imposed really to to measure the 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 workflow around the IAC standard as well as our BCPS function i i can say with confidence that our work whenever possible is mitigated if not within the hour certainly within the 24-hour period and i can showcase and stand proud with that given the fact that if you look at our school closure record based around maintenance problems it's 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 nominal it's nominal by comparison to our partners at other leas in the state it's even nominal by our own benchmark standards and certainly the board would be hearing about any maintenance deficiencies that are not meant to uh, that are not met in terms of a standard to keep the schoolhouse open. So I, I could not agree with you more. And it was one of our biggest challenges as going through this audit process was that I did not have a mechanism to show that mitigation attempt compared to that full closure. So that's uh, that's uh, I, I appreciate you bringing that to light because it is a challenge for us to measure our work, our mitigation efforts, our make safe efforts in comparison to our workflow documentation. Thank you. I, I do have more questions, but I'll stop here. Um, so Ms. thank you, Mr. Wells. Does anybody else have questions? Ms. Booker Dreyer, do, can I speak? This is Ms. Crow. Yes. Yeah, um, I did want to clarify, and we tried to explain in the report about the um, emergencies that they were the completion in the data analytics um, part and that they could have been completed in the 24 hours. However, like he said, they don't have access to that in the, their system. However, when we were doing the actual testing related to the benchmarks, which I think was uh, issue number three, uh, 
Mr. Welsh took the time and we went to two of us went back into the work order system and looked at each individual work order we tested that was an emergency to see if something was done. So it was it's not an easy process that he can just say, OK, these were all done, mitigated in 24 hours, but at least for the ones we tested, we were able to go back and see that they were done and any ones that we had related to emergencies were that nothing was done in that 24 hours. We did not take into consideration that, OK, they fixed it and it was open for another five days because something up another part had to be fixed. But for the actual was it mitigated, made safe, we did look at that for the testing portion. It's more the data analytics that we couldn't distinguish that in that report because there's no way in the system to see that it was mitigated. But we did take that into consideration for the audit. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you, Ms. Crew. Thank you, Mr. Welsh. Thank you all. Okay, so the, um, the next item on the agenda is around the purpose and function of the audit committee. And we know that the Office of Audit, or the purpose and function of the Office of Audit, not the Audit Committee. Um, and we know that the Office of Audit, it's an independent office that reports directly to the board. And we know that the work of the Office of, the, of Audit, it's instrumental in informing governance decisions um, because it's ultimately all about increasing the likelihood of effectiveness within our school system. In 2021, an operational efficiency report was released with several recommendations to enhance and refine the function of the Office of Audit. And as a board, we want to ensure that we are doing our due diligence to maximize the return on investment for the Office of Audit and to ensure that recommendations have been fully addressed. I know in July of 2023, revisions were made to policy 8400 Office of Internal Audit. And after a year of implementation of the revised policy, it is worthwhile to engage in reflection to see if there are additional revisions needed. And so today we wanted to have an open discussion with committee members about the Office of Audit to make to decide if we want to make a recommendation to the full board on whether we stay the course with the current direction that the Office of Audit is going in, or do we adjust the aperture a little bit to refine the scope, which may yield a greater return on investment. And I know that um, you know we this agenda item was brought about at the request of Ms. Harvey, and so Ms. Harvey, I wanted to give you an opportunity to provide any comments that um, that you wanted to share to to frame this conversation. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good good evening, everyone. Uh, I uh, mirror the sentiment and the belief that. Uh, internal audits provide us with crucial information and data about our level of operational proficiency and help us to de make decisions as a board uh, from a governance perspective. And so uh, I am concerned uh, about the allocation of resources. Uh, we have a limited uh, amount of resources in terms of who's conducting audits, a limited amount of resources in terms of the time we have to do audits, and we have a very large uh, system. And uh, I, I reviewed the efficiency report as well, and I think some of the concerns I expressed in the last meeting uh, uh, mirror some of the concerns in the efficiency report. I wonder if it is the best use of the internal audit office to um, investigate individual instances of uh, that they receive on uh, allegations that they receive on the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline, as those generally uh, can be investigated through HR. Uh, I am, based on my understanding of the uh, evaluation process in terms of uh, determining uh, the risk assessment. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, the risk assessment meets all the criterion and recommendations that are 
listed in the efficiency report. And I'm a little concerned that uh, we go to the departments themselves to determine uh, what is to be prioritized or what they feel like to be prioritized in an audit process. And so I, I just think there's, there's a conversation worth having if as a board, um, the internal audit, the Office of Internal Audits reports to the board and its function is really to provide us with the assessment and information that we need uh, on the systems operations as a whole, if there isn't some room for streamlining the work uh, and focusing the work. Okay, thank you, Ms. Harvey. And so I wanted to open it up for discussion. Um, Ms. Harvey brought up some, some great kind of questions to consider on whether or not the risk assessment, does it meet all the criteria in the efficiency report? Um, should the office of uh, should the office of audit be investigating these individuals, um, or is this that come into the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline, or um, is uh, it is better use of or should HR um, is that a matter for HR? Um, and then how can we streamline so that um, we can can better align efforts? I also want to give space to any other committee member. Um, did you want to make any comments before we dive into some of these questions? Okay, so and then I also wanted just to give space also to um, to Miss Barr and or anyone from her team because I know you all have seen the efficiency report. I know that you all have the um, you know do the risk assessment and um, and I'm just wondering your perspective on whether or not that risk assessment does it meet the criteria in the efficiency report. Have you all had the opportunity to do? any of that type, any of that analysis. Ms. Barr has her hand up. Oh, yes, Ms. Barr, I didn't see, I was, yes, I was, yes, go ahead, Ms. Barr. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, so I wasn't exactly um, clear on what was going to be discussed this e evening related to this particular topic. Bringing up the 2021 efficiency report, I'm not sure that the current audit committee members are aware, with perhaps the exception of Mr. McMillian, that there was a lengthy rebuttal that I wrote related to the efficiency report, and the full board at that time voted to reject the recommendations noted in that efficiency report related to the Office of Internal Audit. I would be more than happy to share that rebuttal with uh, the individual audit committee members who are unfamiliar with that information and that document. Uh, as you stated, we recently revised policy 8400, 8410, 8420, and 8430. All of that was done in accordance with Red Book and research, researching other LEAs, um, other organizations to make sure that we were current with what the industry standards were. Um, and this board had the opportunity uh, when it was presented back in July to make comments and questioned um, back in July. And I didn't hear anything with respect uh, to any concerns related to what is in current policy related to the office. Um, when you mentioned about engaging and in, ref in reflection about the uh, policy that has been in place for about a year, it truly policy 8400 actually is the Office of Internal Audit um, Charter, which is very common for internal audit departments to have. Uh, we used to have policy separate, a separate policy and then the charter, but that caused confusion with uh, among um, board members and um, BCPS itself 
So we incorporated uh, our charter into policy 8400 as done by our colleagues in the city and some other surrounding counties. So uh, when you talk about staying the course of internal audit, I very strongly believe that we are completing and conducting the responsibilities that are inherent in an internal audit department, whether it be in a K through 12 education system or externally. And I have several individuals in the office that came from external um, organizations and um, that the that investigations that we conduct are related to fraud, waste and abuse and that the Department of Human Resources does not have the um, same human capital or experience that that we have in conducting those types of investigations. We do turn over the investigations that are unrelated to fraud, waste and abuse to Ms. Stifler in the superintendent's office. And um, that recommendation to have the hotline monitored and and our office do those types of investigations actually came from the external auditors uh, many, many years ago, over, I guess, 20 years ago, perhaps, at this point in time. So the, the things that you're inferring or implying or suggesting are totally out of line with how an internal audit office is supposed to operate in accordance with industry standards, the Institute of Internal Auditors, um, Yellow Book, Red Book, um, and even some of our colleagues throughout the state and nation. And I would open up the floor if if I could to anybody in the office that has anything additional additional to add. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barr. And I, I want to be clear that we're not inferring or suggesting anything. We're just, so as we're looking at, um, we're doing our due diligence. I know it's a it's a new board. There's new things that are happening, and we just want to make sure that we are getting the information that we need to inform our governance decision. So it's not a inferring or suggesting anything. This is truly a discussion um, so that we can determine next steps. Uh, Ms. Harvey. Thank you. Uh, so let me just follow up. I appreciate uh, that there was a rebuttal uh, and the previous board made a decision around that response. What I am going by is what I am experiencing as a current member of the board. Uh, and I too have experience with internal and external auditors. And I can say with all confidence that it is not my inference or my implication or my guess, but it is my experience that we can be more efficient and more focused in the types of audits that we do that will provide us with better information as a board to govern this system. And it is also my experience that the data analysis or that the programmatic analysis that is completed to determine where there are deficiencies or, or proficiencies in a system is directed by the Office of the Audit as opposed to going to the program and asking them what they think needs to be improved. And so I, I, I'm not saying these things or, or asking that we take a look at this on a whim. I am saying it because I believe as a board, we need different types of information. We need more focused information and we need a real look at what is going on in the system so that we can make informed governance decisions. And I appreciate, you know, the, the, the uh, adherence to industry standards and the focus on that. But I also think that we can 
we can do a more focused job on uh, auditing the system in a way that yields results that will help us make decisions. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Mr. McMillian, I saw you came off a of mute. Did you have a comment? Yes. Yes, go ahead, uh, Mr. McMillian. Ms. Barr often refers to the, the Red Book. And, you know, I've been around this a little bit. I'd, I'd like her to expand on what is the Red Book and why is that, you know, something that her department goes by. And then I'm curious, you know, and no, no disrespect intended, you know, we've been talking about experience and with, with different audits or internal audit, external audits. Last, no disrespect, last meeting, I asked Ms. Barr, you know, just, you know, do you have 70 or 80 years experience in your department? And she said, you know, double or triple that, I think was their comment. And I'm just curious if she went back and and can can you tell us how much experience you have in your department and what kind of certifications the members of your department have? Because I, I really don't know if HR, if we move some of this stuff over to HR, HR speak, you know, I don't play pool, but, you know, there's something, a phrase behind the eight ball. It looks to me like HR is behind the eight ball a lot in their endeavors and no disrespect intended there. I'm just talking about, you know, trying to make this a better setting. Thank you. Ms. Barr? Sure. Would you like me to answer your last question first or your first question? It, whatever you're comfortable with, your choice. Okay. So your first question was about the Red Book. The Red Book is the International Professional Practices Framework um, out of the Institute of Internal Auditors. And I, I think I've explained it before that there are different standards depending on like the level and size of your particular audit shop and audit group. And we chose the Red Book because we have a very small audit shop in comparison to some of those groups that that potentially use the yellow book or the orange book. And so it basically lays out the framework um, that an internal audit shop should use in completing its work. And it's it's standards, just like um, uh, we talked about the standards for the, the work order process that the state has, it's standards for internal audit shops. Um, with respect to experience, uh, after the last meeting, I did go back and I added up the combined years of experience that we have in the audit and accounting fields is 259 years, averaging about 26 years of experience per staff member. In addition to holding, um, we have bachelors in business in Spanish, accounting, economics, business administration, and some of us have masters in accounting, information systems, public administration, and education. So we have various certifications and licenses in addition to our, our degrees. Um, we have five certified government auditing professionals, four CPA certified public accountants, five certified internal auditors, seven certified fraud examiners, one certified business manager, one certified information systems auditor, and one certified risk-based internal auditor. When I hear a uh, conversation about focus, focusing resources and helping the system improve, we are on the same page with that. Perhaps the, the approach might be a little bit different based on individual experiences. That is why we went to the risk-based approach, approach because it is, it is a standard in the Red Book and, and that is what colleagues in the state use and in the nation used to develop their work plans. That is why I have asked um, the superintendents, previous and current superintendents for their feedback and input, because that is in the Red Book to, to request that information. Requested the information of previous board members with respect to what they feel uh, certain risks are in the organization. And it, and it is important to go down to the certain levels in the organization to get and get their knowledge and gain information from them so that we assess that information, compile that information, and, and then weight that information to come up with what poses the highest risks at the time that we do that risk assessment. 
And because it is risk-based, and like even Mr. Welsh said, what is an emergency today might not be an emergency tomorrow. Same thing with risk-based. What is a risk today might not be a risk um, tomorrow. So it does take a village to make a determination as to what makes sense and where to focus our limited resources because our resources are, are limited. Um, and I do believe that conducting investigations of fraud, waste, and abuse belong in an office of internal audit. Uh, the, again, the other investigations that we do, we we form out to, um, well, we give that to Ms. Siffler, who then makes a decision as to whom she gives that to. So I think we have come a long way with um, dividing that work up and administering the hotline, and I think we do a good job of it. And we interact well with HR, they interact well with us, uh, with the law office, in order to make sure that that's handled appropriately. With respect to, with respect to the audits that are being done, again, we just started the risk-based approach, and I do believe that, that that is the way to go. But it sounds like we're on the same page with wanting to do what is best for the organization to get you the information that you need to govern and not be so much in operations. And maybe it's the converse, the conversation we, we need to have is how to get there is what it sounds like to me, perhaps. Ms. Barr, thank you very much for answering my questions. And I'm a, a visual learner. Would you mind sending me in an email and the other members of this committee that experience in those different certifications and degrees, please? So I can just look at it rather than sure. just hear it. Thank you very much. Certainly. Ms. Harvey, is your hand up from the last time or do you have another comment? It is. I need to put it down. Thank you. <laughs> Any other board members have a comment? And uh, Ms. Rampong. This is more of a as, of a question as I listen to the conversation. So the Efficiency report was done in 2021, and Ms. Barr has spoken about um, the risk-based approach that has been used. And so I guess what I'm trying to understand is that risk-based approach was not in place at the time of the review in 2021 is what it sounds like. And so could Ms. Barr speak to, I guess, more of the difference between how the audits are being done now as risk-based versus how they were done before and what she sees as, I guess, the positives or the pros of using this approach and maybe even talk specifically to how she sees the information um, from these audits being used to help inform us as board members regarding governance decisions. I know that was a lot, but yeah. <laughs> So previously, we would um, base our audits on um, uh, trends that we were seeing in, in the hotline. Um, just uh, we would offer assistance to the external auditors and trends that they were seeing. And it was just kind of based on on previous trends, whereas um, now it, it is more risk based. We consider the uh, information and all from external folks as well as um, our experience. And I think, for example, the audit that we just presented tonight, that gave uh, committee members and the board, I think, great information related to um, some of the, I guess, deficiencies in um, budget and personnel needed to get the work orders completed in a more timely fashion. So as we're going to more risk-based audits, that's what I'm thinking will be providing the information that the board needs to make better decisions related to governance. And in this case, perhaps a budget decision to perhaps put more funds towards the facilities maintenance area. So that's what we're hoping to do and strive to do to make sure that we're aligned with board goals as well as the superintendent goals. But by doing risk based audits. Thank you. Right. Any other comments? 
So it is important. And I just want to kind of just make sure that we truly underline the importance of the the um, Office of Internal Audit. And we truly want to make sure that we are maximizing our return on investment. Um, and I see that, uh, Mr. Fletcher, you have a, a your hand is raised, so I'll call on you. I did. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. I apologize for raising my hand late. I could not find the proper proper icon to click, but thank you for recognizing that. Um, I, I do apologize. I was not aware we were going to be talking about the the um, the report uh, from 2021, but I was able to find it, and pull it up, and and Miss Madden and I were actually part of a team uh, that was created by Dr. Williams to address the findings and recommendations. Uh, that were brought forth by the Public Works uh, report. And just two things that that I want to point out, and one is from memory. Uh, and so I, I can't speak uh, precisely to this, but as I'm recalling, there was a uh, confusion about risk management versus risk-based auditing. Um, and sometimes those terms would be used interchangeably. Obviously, in internal audit, I would challenge that risk management is, is not a function of audit. Uh, that is a, a um, uh, management of controls. That's more of an operational function, um, which obviously with internal audit, a risk-based approach to review how management is, is managing those risks is, is more applicable, uh, more appropriate for an internal audit function. So I do recall, and, and again, now that we've discussed, I'm gonna go back through this report and, and reread everything. I know Ms. Matt and I have a ton of notes from all of our um, uh, meetings. We were part of a team with individuals from human resources. Um, I believe organizational development at the time was, was part separate uh, separate area. So we had a very diverse group. Um, Ms. Matt and I had had the opportunity to really educate a lot of folks about internal auditing and what it does and what it doesn't do uh, by definition. And so, and and that's ultimately what led to some of the rebuttal and then ultimately the, the board um, uh, reviewing and making their votes. Uh, but one of the things that, um, that the report did contain uh, was talking about the review of um, and I'm sorry, I want to scroll back up so I can and get it in here. Uh, the the level of, of effort put into reviewing activity, uh, school activity funds, things like that. Um, and what it actually stated was that the internal audit staff has to use a significant portion of annual auditing hours that could be devoted to addressing higher risk areas and investigating waste, fraud, and abuse to monitor the activities of the school staff. And so that ultimately is what kicked off our um, change in approach. I, I, we had been discussing it previously, but that is kind of what led us down the route of risk-based auditing so that we can focus on those areas that are important. As Ms. Barr said, getting the input from all the stakeholders, if, if, if it's not important to you as, as a board member or a superintendent or whatever that level may be, then, then why should it be important to us? So we want to make sure that we're it, auditing the right things, focusing our limited resources on the right areas. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, the the um, the fraud, waste and abuse investigations as well. Thank you. Mr. Sorry, Mr. and I apologize again for raising my hand late, but I want to put it down now. <laughs> that is totally fine. Thank you for that additional information. And so ultimately, I mean, I think that, you know, we are in the blueprint era. Uh, there's a lot of changes happening in school systems and there's a lot more that is coming. And so I just wanna ensure that we are doing our due diligence. And so I move that the audit committee lead the development of a plan that clearly outlines an efficient and focused audit process to inform our governance for decision by the full board. And if we find that this plan we laid out, if the audit Office of Audit is already doing that, then great. But I think we need it clearly laid out. I think it's time for the board to have that discussion around what truly are our expectations. Um, and so just to have that, so I'm gonna say this motion again. I move that the audit committee lead the development of a plan that clearly outlines an efficient and focused audit process to inform our governance for, um, to inform our governance decision for consideration by the full board. Is there a second? 
Second, Harvey. May I have a roll? Well, is there any discussion? Miss, Miss and I Bunker. See Ms. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. I was just about to call. I see some hands raised, so go ahead. Is that me or somebody else? Uh, go ahead, Mr. McMillian. Uh, I'm just, how are you going to develop this plan? What, what's, it sounds to me like you have a plan on how to develop the plan. So what, what, what's your plan? And so the first plan is to see if um, the audit committee would like to develop a plan. So that's why that motion was made. I understand. I understand the motion, but what what is the plan? I mean, how are you going to develop it? Who's going to be on the committee? Or is and the so committee the, going to develop a plan? I'm just curious how this plan so is going to die. Right. So the motion is um, that the audit committee is going to lead the development of a plan. So we can map out how the plan is going to be developed, what we want. Like we can map all of that out. The first step is do we even want to move forward with taking this deeper look at what the office of audit of, of this plan around um, our audit process to inform our governance decision? So that's just step one. Okay, Ms. Frimpong, and then I'll go to Ms. Jameson. Jameson. So I just want to make sure that I understand. Um, so the simple motion is just that we develop a plan as a committee. But <clears throat> what I guess I was trying to understand is you said we will, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but my understanding is that we would develop a plan and then we would look at what the audit does. And then you're saying if it's the same, I guess. But then if we are going to be comparing to, if we as a committee, are going to be comparing to what audit does, then why would we not just, I guess, review the existing plan that's in place by audit? And so I think there's, um, it's a worthwhile process for us to, without being um, influenced by kind of what's all what's happening now so that we're not trying to fit something into a frame where we can authentically say as a board this is what we need when we think about the blueprint requirements when we think about shifts that are happening in the school systems this is what we need to see from the office of audit and let's come up with that and then we can look through and say okay this is what we have this is what we want we could share that with the full board to see if that's indeed what they, um, if the full board is in agreement to then begin to modify policy as necessary. But if we're, if we, as a, as a, our audit committee says that if we say that in this plan that we want to, we think everything is great, we want to keep going in the direction that we're going in, then, then we'll keep doing that. But I think that there, it's worthwhile for us to take a fresh look at what we are doing and not necessarily to be influenced by things of the past, because what happened before um, is not necessarily indicative of our future state for the school system. So I'm, um, and so that's that's why I am saying we need just a fresh look at um, at the office of audit and the process that we want to to use as a board. Hey, Ms. Jameson, and then I'll go to Ms. Barr and then Mr. Fletcher. Yes, hello, thank you for letting me speak. My name is Andrea Jameson. I've been an auditor with the Internal Audit Office for about 25 years now. Um, I am concerned about the um, motion that is on the floor, especially in light of the comment that you just made about not being influenced by things of the past. And in fact, bringing up the 2021 efficiency report, which, as we stated, has been rebutted, has been reviewed by lots of people on committees and was voted against by the board. We revised the policies in 2023, which is very recent. I personally do not understand what the what the goal is here. If we have recently reviewed policies and outlined things, if you all are going back to a 2021 efficiency report that, again, was voted down by the board. Um, the other thing I'm concerned about is, and I've 
been paying very close attention when Ms. Barr presented at the full board meeting. The line of questioning she received was about the qualifications of the staff. And I am a highly qualified member of the staff with a master's degree in education, 25 years of experience and certifications in fraud, waste and abuse um, you know, investigation. So as a staff member, I think it's important that you hear from, from at least from me that I don't understand what direction you want to go in, but it seems as though your concerns have been recently addressed. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Ms. Barr? Yes, thank you. I just uh, wanted to, to state that the development of a work plan is the role and responsibility of the Office of Internal Audit. And we have the responsibility to ask you what you want. And that is what I have been trying to do for the past couple of years to gain an understanding of exactly what you just said, what is important to the board, what is important to the superintendent, so that can be incorporated into our work plan. I don't believe it's the role of the audit committee or of the board to develop an Office of Internal Audit work plan, but I do believe it is the responsibility to, to contribute um, when we ask, what is it that you want? Where is it that you think we should focus our resources? And actually part of my presentation later on is the sur risk assessment survey for the uh, board members. And you'll see the uh, line of questioning that would hopefully elicit exactly what you're proposing now, but it would be our responsibility to craft and bring it back to you for your decision to make you and then and then the full board. Um, I don't believe that it is the responsibility of the audit committee to develop a work plan for the Office of Internal Audit, but I do believe very strongly that that you need to contribute when asked what is important to you, where do you think our resources should be focused. That I do agree with. I thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Barr. Ms. Harvey? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate what Ms. Barr uh, just explained. Uh, I, I agree that uh, when, when opportunities are presented to provide input on the direction of uh, what the Office of Internal Auditing is doing, we should fully engage in that process. I am not sure how that process, uh, I'm sure it happens in the audit committee, and I'm not sure if that is an on, being a newcomer to the audit committee, if that is an ongoing process. And I think that the comments speak to um, the, the board's responsibility as the uh, supervisor of the Office of the Internal Audit on uh, making sure that we're moving Oh, Ms. Harvey, you're you're breaking up a little bit. Oh, Ms. Harvey, you're Ms. Harvey, you're breaking up. Um, you'll need to restate what you've said. Oh, Ms. Harvey, you're breaking up on us. So I actually don't think what Ms. Barr said um, is contrary to the motion made. Oh, I, I can't, I'm talking if you can. I'm, I'm getting I will uh, hold my comment. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. And I agree with you. I don't. I I, I think what Ms. Barr said is in direct alignment with what the motion. Um, in what the motion has been made, because it's it's to provide clarity in what the board wants. Um, and so I, I think it's in alignment. It's not a development of a work plan. And Ms. Barr, I see that your hand is raised. Yes, that's what I was just going going to uh, reiterate that um, and and it might be helpful once we get into the, you know, the upcoming presentation of, of the additional uh, of the quarter quarterly reports and the risk assessment update 
to show you what I'm talking about that would solicit the feedback and the input I believe that you're referring to. Um, and I agree with what Ms. Harvey said with what I believe I heard because she was breaking up um, that the board should be providing um, input into uh, what we do, providing input. Um, we should be coming back to the committee uh, and we're doing it quarterly with, with the reports, with the status of where we are with our work plan. And also if we need to change it up and if it's if we have to do it on a monthly basis um, rather than quarterly, you know, maybe that's something that we need to take into consideration. Um, I want to also say that I do appreciate the um, the fact that you are interested in what we do and you are interested in wanting to get uh, the best information provided to you so that you can make decisions. I think where there's a little bit of disagreement or conflict, whatever word you want to use, is the is the approach. I would be afraid that if the committee and what I heard was that you want in the motion that you want the committee to develop the plan, I think that's overstepping into operations, even though you you do we do report to the board through the audit committee. I do still believe we have the responsibility to compile, put it together present it to you for review. And, and if if you'll recall, we have accelerated that process that year based on the comments and feedback received earlier um, from the committee so that now we're, we're moving ahead on the risk assessment. We have the surveys completed and um, we'll be presenting a plan in March to this committee for review, for, it, for consideration. And if you don't like us, don't like it you tell us you don't like it and you think we should be more focused in i don't know um uh, i don't know curriculum and instruction versus division of finances that's just examples that's not you know then we take that into consideration and we have the the, the more meaningful conversations and the discussions and back and forth and keep in mind we just started the risk base so we're refining our process as well so obviously we can get better at what we're doing. We've taken into consideration all the feedback that's already been received and we've changed what we're doing. So we're trying to keep up with the information and the feedback that has already been received by current. I know Ms. Ari, you know, she and you were not here um, previously. So but we are trying to keep up with the, the feedback of current board members and the current superintendent. And, and we've adjusted each each time we've received that feedback, if it makes sense. That's the other piece, you know, and that and that it's in alignment with what our role and responsibility is. So, um, and I I understand that you and Miss Harvey have experience with other uh, internal and external auditors and and departments, but everybody does operate a little bit differently depending on what the industry is and what the needs are of their organization. So all we're trying to do is gain an understanding of what you want and what the board wants and what the superintendent wants and marry that together to come up with a very effective work plan for the organization in FY26. That's all we're asking for. And this part, I think that's exactly what you'll get from this process. Um, it should be very clear. Um, and so the, that's what the, that's the intent of this process. Now, Mr. McMillian, I saw that you came off of mute and then Ms. Harvey had her, her hand up. Mr. McMillian, did you have something to say? Yeah, I've got one <laughs> question and then a, and a comment. Yes. So if, if this motion were to pass in the audit committee, then it goes before the full board, before this plan, starts to be implemented is that correct no so then we would develop a plan we would draft something to take to the full board okay if this motion passes and right. secondly you know i understand the organizational umbrella i understand where internal audit sits out by itself i understand that internal audit comes you know underneath our responsibilities or connected to our responsibilities but there's always a discussion between governance and operation when we're talking about 
you know, the superintendent and she's she, legally she's our one and only employee. And a lot of us, you know, at times we're told we cross over to operations and we need to stay. I understand all of that, but I just want to state that this looks like operations to me. It looks and sounds like operations. And I understand organizational chart. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Ms. Harvey. Uh, so I, I agree again with what Ms. Barr just said. I think where the confusion is coming is in the multiple uses of the word plan. I, 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 I understood the intent of the motion to do just what we've been discussing in the last few minutes was for the audit committee to look at our system and to look at where we believe uh, resources and priority should come for audit, providing that feedback that Ms. Barr has been soliciting uh, from the board, uh, you know, now that there's, there, or that there's some interest, you know, and, and would it not be better to do that now to inform the March plan that the internal audit department is going to put forth rather than have the plan and then go back to it and and revise it? Wouldn't it be better to, to have this committee make that effort now, provide that feedback to Ms. Barr and her team so that it informs what she's going to provide for us in March? I agree. And so I see we have Mr. Fletcher, Ms. Barr, and Mr. Young. So uh, we, and I, it, I will, uh, and I, we haven't heard from Mr. Young yet, so I really want to give him an opportunity. So Mr. Young, um, I'm going to call on you first. Thank you. Based upon what has been said, this motion seems to um, basically duplicate um, what the current operating procedures are that Ms. Barr and her team follows, we may just need to um, maybe taking Ms. Harvey's input of, yes, providing information today to help them build that plan. But, you know, the motion seems to be just already repeating what their current process is. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fletcher. Thank you again uh, for my hand raise and everything this time. One time, uh, just wanted to point out, and it's something actually that that Mr. Young um, kind of addressed and Mr. McMillian addressed a little bit earlier, uh, in that it, it there is a a, differ a differentiation between operations and governance. Um, and in 80, policy eighty four hundred, it, it actually states that internal audit will remain free from interference from the board, its members, and employees related to matters of audit selection, scope, procedures, frequency, timing, report, um, and just talking about our independence and objectivity. And so I, I think that's why our process is set up the way that it is now. Uh, and I know Ms. Barr is going to talk about it a little bit more um, in, in the next part of our, our agenda. But that process is in place so that we can obtain the information from our stakeholders. We can receive that um, that information from them while still remaining independent and objective. Um, and, and you know, throughout policy, it, it's called internal audits work plan. Um, and so I could see if your motion is approved, then that process goes through. I could see some concern or confusion about. Is it a work plan of the audit committee? Is it internal audits work plan? Is it, and I know we, we talked about the differentiation of the word plan um, or, or the difference between the word plan being used. Uh, but that's just something, again, um, our role is to kind of uh, work together and and us caution you and, and, and tell you about things that we see. Um, and as an external or as an, an auditor sitting here looking at policy, I would say that motion uh, could potentially violate that piece of 8400, depending on what the next steps could be. 
Thank you. Ms. Barr. Hi. Yes, I just wanted to respond to um, uh, back to what Ms. Harvey said about working together and gathering information prior to the March 18th. That is exactly why we why we send these surveys out um, in advance and we have the interviews with individuals in advance. This year we're accelerating things and, and my intention is to review the, the survey questions for the board. And it's not just for the audit committee, it's for the entire board to get their feedback and um, and then again, compile that information, send the surveys out to the chiefs. It is a very, very involved process. And that is and will be not only the committee members opportunity, but the board's opportunity to provide us feedback to develop our work plan that we then bring to the audit committee and have the audit committee vet the work plan before it is presented to the full board for its approval. And and again, that happens in, in June or July. So again, it sounds like we all, I think, want the same bottom line, but I'm not sure that the approach is that we're agreeing on the approach. And thank you again for the opportunity to speak. But I think if you saw the survey, you would see that the nature of the questions and the opportunity that you would have to provide the information back uh, back to us. And I did. Uh, and Mr. Fletcher spoke uh, ahead of me on policy 8400. I share the, uh, the concern that he has that that this motion could be in violation of policy policy 8400. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Uh, a couple things, I, I, and I'm going to re-review policy 8400. I'm not sure. Um, it, it is a little concerning to me that the board, according to the policy, has, you know, it, that it says free from the board when Ms. Barr reports to the board. So I don't know how those things um, jive together. But in light of this conversation uh, and in the spirit of uh, look, looking to see what, uh, what Ms. Barr is going to present coming forward, uh, I would um, like to admit, uh, table the motion until after we have seen that presentation. Is there a second? Second from Paul. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. All in favor? Motion carries. So we will table uh, the motion. Now I'm being mindful of time because this goes until six and it is now after 6 p.m. Um, I will, we could schedule another audit meeting to complete the agenda items for, um, for today. So let's see, we still need, just pulling up. So there's the um, FY25 quarter one update, the investigation risk assessment, and um, there was something that we needed in admin function session. So we will, so I move that we to reschedule this to, well, not to reschedule, but to schedule another audit committee meeting prior to the previously scheduled one. Prior to the next scheduled meeting, um, prior to November 12th, that we schedule an audit committee meeting 
to review the work plan and to um, address the administrative function session. Second, Harvey. May I have any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Thank you, uh, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Yes. Ms. Frempong. Yes. Ms. Harvey. Yes. Mr. Young. Yes. Mr. McMillian. Yes. All in favor. Yes. So motion carries. And so we will send out a, um, we'll have Ms. Gover identify another date where everyone is available to complete the, um, these, the agenda items that we have listed. Our next, the next meeting on the announcements is November 12th, 2024, but we will look to have a meeting before then, and that will be posted on, um, and that will be posted and made available to the public. And so the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thank you.